You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with political correspondent at the Financial Times, Jasmine Cameron Chileshi, and economics editor of The Spectator, Kate Andrews. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. On the front of the eye, striking nurses are warning Sunak to improve wage offer or face more walkouts as the latest wave of strikes hit a and &E, intensive care and cancer wards for the first time. On the front of the Telegraph, cancer nurses go on strike for the first time with the head of the RCN, Pat Cullen, warning industrial action could go on for years. Meanwhile, the front of the Daily Mail reports that the UK hospitality sector is set for a £1 billion boost thanks to the coronation and also Liverpool's hosting of the Eurovision Song Contest. The build-up to the coronation continues on the front of the Mirror, which reports that Prince William will pay tribute to King Charles and Camilla in a heartfelt speech after the coronation concert. The Daily Express reports that pensioners were underpaid an extraordinary £530 million last year due to errors by officials. The paper says 1.3 million older people are affected. On the front page of the Financial Times, a report on US bank First Republic nearing collapse with three large banks bidding for the troubled lender. Meanwhile, the Daily Star warns that homes are under threat from a plague of 300 million obese rats. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by the political correspondent at the Financial Times, Jasmine Cameron Chileshi, and economics editor of The Spectator, Kate Andrews. Welcome to you both. Let's start first off with the Telegraph and uh, the nurses' strike, which uh, commenced this evening. Um, but the difference this time, cancer nurses are on strike also. Jasmine. Yeah, so this latest action by the Royal College of Nursing really rep represents an escalation in this industrial dispute. So as the Telegraph notes for the first time, nurses on cancer wards will be striking. We also know that um, nurses on some emergency departments and intensive care wards are also taking part in the, the strike. And this comes after the Royal College of Nursing rejected the government's pay offer, um, which I think included a one-off payment and a 5% pay hike for this um, financial year. And I think there's a real sense of trepidation um, among NHS leaders who are concerned at the longer term impact that these strikes can have. Now, as is often the case with these strikes, um, the NHS has said that um, if, they're, if you're in a life threatening situation, you can still call the service and you'll still be treated. But some of the bigger impacts will be felt on some of the appointments um, and elective operations that will need to be postponed or rescheduled as a result of these strikes. And so there is a lot of uneasiness among NHS leaders at what impact this can have. And I think there is a real feeling of, of weariness at the moment, I think, of where this um, where the strike action ends. The uh, RCN are calling on the government to put forward an improved offer. Um, we heard from um, Transport Secretary Mark Harper and the Health Secretary today arguing that the offer that they've put forward to unions is actually a fair one. And so we seem to have hit a bit of a stalemate. And of course, it will be, um, you know, patients that will be feeling the, the brunt of this. And all of this puts a lot of pressure on the government to really get back to the negotiating table and find some sort of resolution. Yes, I mean, exemptions have been uh, agreed, Kate, but um, what do you think the repercussions will be in terms of public support for the nurses striking? There is a lot of public support still for the nurses in particular, but as these NHS strikes continue to go on, already hundreds of thousands of operations and appointments have been cancelled. The more that happens, the more frustrated ill patients are going to become indeed. This is tricky, tricky territory for both the RCN and the government because uh, the, the pay deal was rejected, not by a huge margin, it was about 56% of the RCN members who voted who decided to reject the deal. Um, and, and so, you know, it was much closer than a lot of people expected. And you do have other unions like Unison, which have accepted 
the pay deal. So I think the pressure is on there, but of course the concern for the government and what the RCN leaders and other NHS leaders are banking on is that if they reballot their members, which they're planning to do and strike for another six months, that takes them close to 2024 and that takes us probably into an election year. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's tricky territory for the government as well. So no party is doing too well out of these negotiations going on and on and on. Um, and as you point out there, Gillian, there have been exceptions that are going to be made to make sure there's a minimum standard of service in, in the emergency rooms. But that is not applying to cancer services. And I think, you know, we could certainly debate whether or not cancer services should be in the emergency category. I think they should. Um, and, and so there are going to be yet again so many crucial appointments canceled. These are not necessarily just routine appointments, really important important ones that are being canceled. And it, it you know, it, as Jasmine says, it's, it's really putting pressure on everybody to come to the table because increasingly nobody looks as if they're going to win this very horrible debate that's taking place in such a public way. Uh, and Jasmine, we move to the eye and they have the warning from the nurses themselves to the Prime Minister that the uh, wage offer needs to be improved or there will be more walkouts. And um, also, I think one of the papers was quoting Pat Cullen as, as saying that... Uh, this dispute could go on for years, potentially. Mm. It was actually really interesting listening to Pat Cullen, who was on um, Sky earlier this morning, as she was laying out the union's case for continued industrial action and essentially saying, yes, she understood the concerns by NHS leaders that, you know, the potential risks, but also her counter argument is that actually some of the underlying problems in the NHS that nurses are striking against are also putting patients at risk. So, so notably staff shortages and some of the working conditions that um, nurses have to uh, have to perform their jobs under and I think it's you know it's it's quite interesting to see where this um, debate where this issue will eventually land because part of the um, you know one of the points that's being put forward by some of the health unions is that there's a lot of underlying problems within the health service that do need to be addressed and we know this is not just about pay it's about working conditions it's about the turnover of staff it's about hours there are all these very existential questions that are being asked of the NHS are being asked of the government at the moment. And so, you know, I would be very surprised if this is a matter that can be concluded in a matter of days. I think we are, you know, both sides are getting ready for a very prolonged um, fight over this. Yes, and Kate, as you were alluding to earlier, um, the RCN um, insider, according to the, the eye, is uh, suggesting that the extended strikes will damage the Prime Minister at, at the polls. I mean, it would be in his interest uh, going into a pre-election year to get this this sorted, but we just don't seem to be any closer to that. Well, you can see that the Labour Party have been trying to capitalise on these strikes when it comes to putting to the government, why aren't you able to settle this? Why aren't you able to get doctors and nurses back into hospital to see their patients? You know, they're taking a, a very political line on this and they're hoping that will be to their advantage because, of course, it does look bad to have these strikes continuing for months and months and months on end. Of course, the, the other side of that equation um, is the fact that, as I said, you do have some unions accepting the deal that will encourage the government stands, which is that they are offering something that should be seen as fair, or at least something that should settle the issue for now and perhaps is something to return to later. Um, and as well, there's a question of where the money actually comes from, of course, because we're talking across the board of billions and billions of pounds that are going to be pledged indefinitely because these are salaries, you know, for future years as well. It's not necessarily going to be a, a one-off payment. Um, so, you know, really difficult questions. And, and whilst the Labour Party is trying to capitalize on this, they have also strongly hinted that they probably wouldn't be able to deliver some of the requests that we've seen around, say, the junior doctors asking for more than a 30 percent pay raise, um, you know, some of the nurses starting around 19 percent. Um, you know, these are really hefty pay raises that even the Labour Party has started to concede they probably couldn't fully deliver on. Um, but of course, they're not in charge. The Tory party is. And, and this does fundamentally remain a headache for number 10. Indeed. Uh, Jasmine, take us to the FT and the fears of a US bank collapse. Uh, First Republic we're talking about. Yes, so the paper's reporting that um, around two banks have submitted um, bids to try to save this struggling um, bank. And obviously it comes in the, in the midst of the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. And I think at the moment there's just a lot of uncertainty in the financial sector. Certainly no one's suggesting that this is a repeat of the 2008 financial crash, but there is a, there is a feeling of unease. And actually I think there are a lot of questions now being asked of some of the... Um, 
uh, regulators in in the US, in Europe, and you know how closely were we looking at some of these um, financial institutions? There are questions for the institutions themselves as to what cultures they were working under, whether they had put in place sustainable um, means to kind of weather you know any sort of changes in the global economy, be that the war or the hike in interest rates. So yeah, it's a very um, there's a lot of unease at the moment in the in, in the sector, and obviously the US regulators and these various banks that are trying to put in bids are. are Hoping that they're trying to secure some sort of deal before the markets open next week. And Kate, it does seem quite a, an extreme uh, situation with uh, First Republic shares um, have lost more than 97% of their value this year. That's an incredibly high amount. Yes, for First Republic, it seems a lot of the assets that they were holding to have lost significant value over this year. And this is now an extension of the regional banking crisis that we have seen in the United States. Of course, with Silicon Valley Bank, we discovered that um, you know they had not properly hedged interest rates and they had just assumed that they would stay ultra low forever. And of course, that turned out not to be the case. So in many of these instances, we're seeing the effects that rising rates can have. And of course, we're not talking about huge escalations, actually, historically, interest rates are still quite normal, if not on the low side, but assumptions were made. And even regulators, as Jasmine says, seem to go seem to go along with these assumptions and they were fundamentally wrong. But the real goal of government now is to make sure that First Republic has a buyer before markets open or almost as soon as uh, very close to after markets open, because the real concern at this point is that you don't start getting such levels of instability that it makes uh, investors even more nervous when it comes to the widening banking sector. So if you can show that there are people who are interested, that there are buyers and big banks that think, see, can see the as a potential investment for the future that will hopefully offset any kind of run that you might see on bigger banks. Uh, so, you know, the goal right now is to do this in a very short period of time.